Christianity and its problems. Carl Jung hypothesized that the European mind found itself motivated to develop the cognitive technologies of science to investigate the material world after implicitly concluding that Christianity, with its laser-like emphasis on spiritual salvation, had failed to sufficiently address the problem of suffering in the here and now. This realization became unbearably acute in the three or four centuries before the Renaissance. In consequence, a strange, profound, compensatory fantasy began to emerge deep in the collective Western psyche, manifesting itself first in the strange musings of alchemy and developing, only after many centuries, into the fully articulated form of science. It was the alchemists who first seriously began to examine the transformations of matter, hoping to discover the secrets of health, wealth, and longevity. These great dreamers, Newton foremost among them, intuited and then imagined that the material world, damned by the church, held secrets the revelation of which could free humanity from its earthly pain and limitations. It was that vision, driven by doubt, that provided the tremendous collective and individual motivational power necessary for the development of science, with its extreme demands on individual thinkers for concentration and delay of gratification. This is not to say that Christianity, even in its incompletely realized form, was a failure. Quite the contrary. Christianity achieved the well-nigh impossible. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master and commoner and noblemen alike on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. Christianity insisted that even the king was only one among many. For something so contrary to all apparent evidence to find its footing, the idea that worldly power and prominence were indicators of God's particular favor had to be radically de-emphasized. This was partly accomplished through the strange Christian insistence that salvation could not be attained through effort or worth, through works. Whatever its limitations, the development of such doctrine prevented king, aristocrat, and wealthy merchant alike from lording it morally over the commoner. In consequence, the metaphysical conception of the implicit transcendent worth of each and every soul established itself against impossible odds as the fundamental presupposition of Western law and society. That was not the case in the world of the past, and is not the case yet in most places in the world of the present. It is in fact nothing short of a miracle, and we should keep that fact firmly before our eyes, that the hierarchical slave-based societies of our ancestors reorganized themselves under the sway of an ethical-slash-religious revelation such that the ownership and absolute domination of another person came to be viewed as wrong. It would do us well to remember as well that the immediate utility of slavery is obvious, and that the argument that the strong should dominate the weak is compelling, convenient, and eminently practical, at least for the strong. This means that a revolutionary critique of everything slave-owning societies valued was necessary before the practice could even be questioned, let alone halted, including the idea that wielding power and authority made the slave owner noble including the even more fundamental idea that the power wielded by the slave owner was valid and even virtuous. Christianity made explicit the surprising claim that even the lowliest person had rights, genuine rights, and that sovereign and state were morally charged at a fundamental level to recognize those rights. Christianity put forward explicitly the even more incomprehensible idea that the act of human ownership degraded the slaver previously viewed as admirable nobility, as much or even more than the slave. We fail to understand how difficult such an idea is to grasp. We forget that the opposite was self-evident throughout most of human history. We think that it is the desire to enslave and dominate that requires explanation. We have it backwards yet again. This is not to say that Christianity was without its problems. But it is more appropriate to note that they were the sort of problems that emerge only after an entirely different set of more serious problems has been solved. The society produced by Christianity was far less barbaric than the pagan, even the Roman ones it replaced. Christian society, at least, recognized that feeding slaves to ravenous lions for the entertainment of the populace was wrong, even if many barbaric practices still existed. It objected to infanticide, to prostitution, and to the principle that might means right. It insisted that women were as valuable as men, even though we are still working out how to manifest that insistence politically. It demanded that even a society's enemies be regarded as human, 
Finally, it separated church from state so that all two human emperors could no longer claim the veneration due to gods. All of this was asking the impossible, but it happened. As the Christian revolution progressed, however, the impossible problems it had solved disappeared from view. That's what happens to problems that are solved. And after the solution was implemented, even the fact that such problems had ever existed disappeared from view. Then and only then could the problems that remained less amenable to quick solution by Christian doctrine came to occupy a central place in the consciousness of the West, come to motivate, for example, the development of science aimed at resolving the corporeal material suffering that was still all too painfully extant within successfully Christianized societies. The fact that automobiles pollute only becomes a problem of sufficient magnitude to attract public attention when the far worse problems that the internal combustion engine solves has vanished from view. People stricken with poverty don't care about carbon dioxide. It's not precisely that CO2 levels are irrelevant, it's that they're irrelevant when you're working yourself to death, starving, scraping a bare living from the stony, unyielding thorn and thistle infested ground. It's that they're irrelevant until after the tractor is invented and hundreds of millions stop starving. In any case, by the time Nietzsche entered the picture, in the late 19th century, the problems Christianity had left unsolved had become paramount. Nietzsche described himself, with no serious overstatement, as philosophizing with a hammer. His devastating critique of Christianity, already weakened by its conflict with the very science to which it had given rise, involved two main lines of attack. Nietzsche claimed, first, that it was precisely the sense of truth developed in the highest sense by Christianity itself that ultimately came to question, and then to undermine the fundamental presuppositions of the faith. That was partly because the difference between moral or narrative truth and objective truth had not yet been fully comprehended, and so an opposition was presumed where none necessarily exists. But that does not belie the point. Even when the modern atheists opposed to Christianity belittle fundamentalists for insisting, for example, that the creation account in Genesis is objectively true, they are using their sense of truth, highly developed over the centuries of Christian culture, to engage in such argumentation. Carl Jung continued to develop Nietzsche's arguments decades later, pointing out that Europe awoke during the Enlightenment, as if from a Christian dream, noticing that everything it had heretofore taken for granted could and should be questioned. God is dead, said Nietzsche. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, murderers of all murderers, console ourselves? That which was the holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off of us? The central dogmas of the Western faith were no longer credible, according to Nietzsche, given that the Western mind now considered truth. But it was his second attack on the removal of the true moral burden of Christianity during the development of the church that was most devastating. The hammer-wielding philosopher mounted an assault on an early established and then highly influential line of Christian thinking, that Christianity meant accepting the proposition that Christ's sacrifice, and only that sacrifice, had redeemed humanity. This did not mean absolutely that a Christian who believed that Christ died on the cross for the salvation of mankind was thereby freed from any and all personal moral obligation, but it did strongly imply that the primary responsibility for redemption had already been borne by the Savior, and that nothing too important to do remained for all too fallen human individuals. Nietzsche believed that Paul, and later the Protestants following Luther, had removed moral responsibility from Christ's followers. They had watered down the idea of the imitation of Christ. This imitation was the sacred duty of the believer not to adhere, or merely to mouth, a set of statements about abstract belief, but instead to actually manifest the spirit of the Savior in the particular, specific conditions of his or her life. To realize or incarnate the archetype, as Jung had it. To clothe the eternal pattern in flesh. Nietzsche writes, the Christians never practiced the actions Jesus prescribed them, and the impudent, garrulous talk about the justification by faith and its supreme and sole significance is only the consequence of the church's lack of courage and will to profess the works Jesus demanded. 
Nietzsche was, indeed, a critic without parallel. Dogmatic belief in the central axioms of Christianity, that Christ's crucifixion redeemed the world, that salvation was reserved for the hereafter, and that salvation could not be achieved through works, had three mutually reinforcing consequences. First, devaluation of the significance of earthly life as only the hereafter mattered. This also meant that it had become acceptable to overlook and shirk responsibility for the suffering that existed in the here and now. Second, passive acceptance of the status quo because salvation could not be earned in any case through effort in this life, a consequence that Marx also derided with his proposition that religion was the opiate of the masses. And finally, third, the right of the believer to reject any real moral burden outside of the stated belief in salvation through Christ, because the Son of God had already done all the important work. It was for such reasons that Dostoevsky, who was a great influence on Nietzsche, also criticized institutional Christianity, although he arguably managed it in a more ambiguous, but also more sophisticated manner. In his masterwork, The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky had his atheist superman, Ivan, tell a little story. The Grand Inquisitor A brief review is in order. Ivan speaks to his brother Alyosha, whose pursuits as a monastic novitiate he holds in contempt, of Christ returning to earth at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. The returning savior makes quite a ruckus as would be expected. He heals the sick, he raises the dead. His antics soon attract attention from the Grand Inquisitor himself, who promptly has Christ arrested and thrown into a prison cell. Later, the Inquisitor pays him a visit. He informs Christ that he is no longer needed. His return is simply too great a threat to the church. The Inquisitor tells Christ that the burden he laid on mankind, the burden of existence and faith and truth, was simply too great for mere mortals to bear. The Inquisitor claims that the church, in its mercy, diluted that message, lifting the demand for perfect being from the shoulders of its followers providing them instead with the simple and merciful escapes of faith and the afterlife. That work took centuries, says the Inquisitor, and the last thing the church needs after all that effort is the return of the man who insisted that people bear all the weight in the first place. Christ listens in silence. Then, as the Inquisitor turns to leave, Christ embraces him and kisses him on the lips. The Inquisitor turns white in shock. Then he goes out leaving the cell door open. The profundity of this story and the greatness of spirit necessary to produce it can hardly be exaggerated. Dostoevsky, one of the great literary geniuses of all time, confronted the most serious existential problems in all his great writings, and he did so courageously, headlong, and heedless of the consequences. Clearly Christian, he nonetheless adamantly refuses to make a straw man of his rationalist and atheistic opponents. Quite the contrary, Karamazov, for example, Dostoevsky's atheist Ivan, argues against the presuppositions of Christianity with unsurpassable clarity and passion. Alyosha, aligned with the church by temperament and decision, cannot undermine a single one of his brother's arguments, although his faith remains unshakable. Dostoevsky knew and admitted that Christianity had been defeated by the rational faculty, by the intellect even. But, and this is of primary importance, he did not hide from that fact. He didn't attempt through denial or deceit or even satire to weaken the position that opposed what he believed to be most true and valuable. He instead placed action above words and addressed the problem successfully. By the novel's end, Dostoevsky has the great embodied moral goodness of Alyosha, the novitiate's courageous imitation of Christ, attained victory over the spectacular but ultimately nihilistic critical intelligence of Ivan. The Christian church described by the Grand Inquisitor is the same church pilloried by Nietzsche. Childish, sanctimonious, patriarchal, servant of the state. That church is everything rotten still objected to by modern critics of Christianity. Nietzsche, for all his brilliance, allows himself anger but does not perhaps sufficiently temper it with judgment. This is where Dostoevsky truly transcends Nietzsche, in my estimation, where Dostoevsky's great literature transcends Nietzsche's mere philosophy. The Russian writer's Inquisitor is the genuine article in every sense. He is an opportunistic, cynical, manipulative, and cruel interrogator willing to persecute heretics, 
even to torture and kill them. He is the purveyor of a dogma he knows to be false. But Dostoevsky has Christ, the archetypal perfect man, kiss him anyway. Equally importantly, in the aftermath of the kiss, the Grand Inquisitor leaves the door ajar so Christ can escape his pending execution. Dostoevsky saw that the great, corrupt edifice of Christianity still managed to make room for the spirit of its founder. That's the gratitude of a wise and profound soul for the enduring wisdom of the West, despite its faults. It's not as if Nietzsche was unwilling to give the faith, and more particularly Catholicism, its due. Nietzsche believed that the long tradition of unfreedom characterizing dogmatic Christianity, its insistence that everything be explained within the confines of a single coherent metaphysical theory, was a necessary precondition for the emergence of the disciplined but free modern mind. As he stated in Beyond Good and Evil, The long bondage of the spirit the persistent spiritual will to interpret everything that happened according to a Christian scheme and in every occurrence to rediscover and justify the Christian God in every accident, all this violence, arbitrariness, severity, dreadfulness, and unreasonableness has proved itself the disciplinary means whereby the European spirit has attained its strength, its remorseless curiosity, and subtle mobility, granted also that much irrecoverable strength and spirit had to be stifled suffocated and spoiled in the process. For Nietzsche and Dostoevsky alike, freedom, even the ability to act, requires constraint. For this reason they both recognize the vital necessity of the dogma of the Church. The individual must be constrained, molded, even brought close to destruction by a restrictive, coherent, disciplinary structure before he or she can act freely and competently. Dostoevsky, with his great generosity of spirit, granted to the church, corrupt as it might be, a certain element of mercy, a certain pragmatism. He admitted that the spirit of Christ, the world-engendering Logos, had historically, and might still find its resting place, even its sovereignty, within that dogmatic structure. If a father disciplines his son properly, he obviously interferes with his freedom, particularly in the here and now. He puts limits on the voluntary expression of his son's being, forcing him to take his place as a socialized member of the world. Such a father requires that all that childish potential be funneled down a single pathway. In placing such limitations on his son, he might be considered a destructive force, acting as he does to replace the miraculous plurality of childhood with a single narrow actuality. But if the father does not take such action, he merely lets his son remain Peter Pan, the eternal boy, king of the lost boys, ruler of the non-existent Neverland. That is not a morally acceptable alternative. The dogma of the church was undermined by the spirit of truth strongly developed by the church itself. That undermining culminated in the death of God. But the dogmatic structure of the church was a necessary disciplinary structure, a long period of unfreedom, adherence to a singular, interpretive structure is necessary for the development of a free mind. Christian dogma provided that unfreedom, but the dogma is dead at least to the modern Western mind. It perished along with God. What has emerged from behind its corpse, however, and this is an issue of central importance, is something even more dead, something that was never alive even in the past. Nihilism as well as an equally dangerous susceptibility to new, totalizing utopian ideas. It was in the aftermath of God's death that the great collective horrors of communism and fascism sprang forth, as both Dostoevsky and Nietzsche predicted they would. Nietzsche, for his part, posited that individual human beings would have to invent their own values in the aftermath of God's death. But this is the element of his thinking that appears weakest psychologically. We cannot invent our own values because we cannot merely impose what we believe on our souls. This was Carl Jung's great discovery, made in no little part because of his intense study of the problems posed by Nietzsche. We rebel against our own totalitarianism as much as that of others. I cannot merely order myself to action, and neither can you. I will stop procrastinating, I say, but I don't. I will eat properly, I say, but I don't. I will end my drunken misbehavior, I say, but I don't. I cannot merely make myself over in the image constructed by my intellect, particularly if that intellect is possessed by an ideology. 
I have a nature, and so do you, and so do we all. We must discover that nature and contend with it before making peace with ourselves. What is it that we most truly are? What is it that we could most truly become knowing who we most truly are? We must get to the very bottom of things before such questions can truly be answered.